fellow seekers of mystery and justice. I'm Kitty, your guide into the enigmatic realm of New England. Welcome to mine, Missing, Murdered, Unidentified in New England, where we delve into the chilling tales that have haunted the corners of Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Prepare to embark on a journey through the shadows of the last decade, from the start of 2010 to the close of 2020. Our stories, sourced from the depths of history, are as diverse as the New England landscapes they unfold in. Some episodes will lead us on an extensive exploration, while others may be swift glimpses. For these cases often shroud themselves in secrecy, leaving us with only morsels of information to feast upon. Within these episodes, Every word, every theory, and yes, even every mistake and misstep is a product of my own relentless pursuit of the truth. I promise to keep you informed with updates and correct any mistakes along the way. While I won't give trigger warnings for the wounds we uncover, after all, they are an essential part to the narrative, I'll be mindful with the more sensitive topics. We'll issue trigger warnings when discussing subjects of suicide animal loss, domestic violence, and others, to ensure a respectful and considerate journey through the mysteries that await. So dear listener, fasten your seatbelt and let's explore the shadows of New England together. August 1st, 2011. Boston police discovered a 70 to 75 year old white female in her underwear deceased at her residence on August 1st, 2011. The decedent had three to three and a half inch long white hair and an unknown eye color due to decomposition and putrefaction. Only one comparison has been made and that was to Virginia Douglas who was last contacted in 1988 and missing from Middlesex, Mass. No other information is available please call 1-800-494-TIPS with any information. August 6th, 2011. Rakita Smalls was born on April 15th, 1989, was 22, known for her smile and work ethic as a stop and shop employee in Westport, Connecticut, and was a 2007 basic high school graduate. Iroquois, a.k.a. Iraq, was a West Hill High School grad, a father to a daughter named Dynasty, and an uncle to at least one nephew, and was only home for a few short months from an eight-year stint in prison for robbery when he and friend Rakita Smalls were senselessly murdered. Iraq and Rakita, both Bridgeport, Connecticut residents, were sitting in Iraq's black Honda sedan on Avenue B in Norwalk, Connecticut, when they were gunned down on August 6, 2011. The car was faced away from the curb and looked like the driver was either pulling away or parallel parking with the passenger side window was shot out. A neighbor looked outside with binoculars to determine what had happened and discovered Rakita with a gunshot wound to the head. Avenue B residents reported a black woman slumped over in the front seat of a black car with a broken window, unresponsive, shortly before 8 a.m. Original analysis couldn't determine if this tragedy was a murder-suicide or a double homicide, and thankfully it was eventually determined to be a double homicide. Lead detective Christopher Imperato said, he wouldn't be surprised if there were people not on the police department's radar that possess vital information. And if people do have a fear of coming forward, a fear of retaliation, it's completely understandable. It's something they've run into numerous times during the investigation. But reassure, their identity and their safety is paramount to us. That comes first and foremost, Imperato said. The inner circle of friends allegedly know who the killer is, yet they remain tight-lipped. I am the mother of a murdered child, said Natasha Smalls. Her name was Rakita Smalls. She wasn't just a girl found dead in a car. She's my daughter. I'm asking anyone 
who has information to please come forward. Winter Alston, Iraq's sister, identified her brother's belongings in the evening he and Rakita were killed. When Iraq was killed, his daughter was taken from dance class and held in suspense as to why, until her begging and pleading led to her being told that her dad was killed. According to law enforcement, there is an unnamed person of interest in the case. There was, at one point, a $50,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible for these senseless murders. Some outlets have expressed that law enforcement has been less than diligent in their solving of this case. However, anyone with information about the killings can call Imperato at 1-203-854-3190, the Norwalk Police Detective Bureau Information Line at 1-203-854-3011, or the anonymous Norwalk police tip line at 1-203-854-3111. August 7th, 2011. I remember in eighth grade when I was the new kid, you were the first person to talk to me and crack jokes so that I would feel comfortable. R.I.P. Elvis, and your mom too. That is just one of the many heartfelt messages left on the online memorial for Elvis Sanchez, a.k.a. Elvis Castro, and his mother, Elvira Pimitel. 17-year-old Elvis appeared in court where the Commonwealth wanted him to testify against those who killed Wilfredo Martinez on June 5, 2011, info Elvis likely had and likely refused to share with authorities. It is unknown if Elvis testified in front of the grand jury. Elvis was at one point suspected of Wilfredo's murder. He was detained and his home searched. And yet it was Elvis's upstairs neighbor, 17-year-old Laquan Miller, who was subsequently arrested for Wilfredo's murder. The only record that Elvis had was for a 2010 gun possession charge, though his association with the, quote, group tied to Archdale Road in Roslindale, who are described as a gang, one that Laquan and Wilfredo were also part of, may have attributed to his and his mother's murders. The murder of Wilfredo took place outside of an apartment complex where he and his friend Kareem Dowling, who survived being shot in the back twice and once in the arm, were hanging out. Earlier in the evening, there was a party at the apartment where Elvis, his brother, their mom, and her boyfriend lived. According to private comments, two men were seen loitering around the apartment building, and when they realized that the party had ended and the guests had left the place, they fired shots at the Pimichel, Sanchez family, and their friend. Elvis... Elvira and her 34-year-old boyfriend were shot in the cream-colored building at 3964 Washington Street, second-floor apartment, at 3.45 a.m. on August 7, 2011. The trio were riddled with bullets. Only the unknown boyfriend survived. Elvis's brother wasn't home at the time of the shooting. Neighbors revealed... Nothing. Elvis's family were normal people who didn't cause any problems. More protection is needed for witnesses, as people are scared to come forward because they are or they feel to be threatened. The current program offers to get specified witnesses and their relatives out to another part of Massachusetts for several months, but that's only if the police deem the information worthy, which even just going to the police can be dangerous for some people. Several days after the murders, a marked cruiser was stationed outside of one of Elvis's relatives' homes. Elvis and Elvira are buried in the cemetery in the northern area of Paravia, in the capital city of Bonnie in the Dominican Republic. The pair were featured on a Massachusetts cold case playing card. If you have any information, please call 1-800-494-TIPS. 
August 10th, 2011. 26-year-old Anthony Stone was a 2003 Montclair High School graduate. Anthony was discovered with a gunshot wound to the abdomen, as well as to the head, in the early hours of August 10th, 2011, at 372 Broadway in Providence, Rhode Island. Prior to running out into the street, Anthony had been inside his home where he was bound and shot. When Anthony was found, he still had the plastic handcuffs attached to one of his wrists. Anthony had a history of selling cocaine and had been arrested for this crime a few months before his slaying. If you have any information, please call 1-401-444-1216. August 10th, 2011. Ronnie Alante was 25 and lived in either Providence or Pawtucket, Rhode Island. A Lincoln Woods State Park Ranger found Ronnie's car outside of Twin River Road parked in a driveway 200 yards from the Lincoln Woods State Park, parked for hours with the wipers on. Ronnie was discovered hands bound behind his back, shot several times in the face in the trunk of the car he was borrowing. Ronnie's family thinks that he was likely murdered over missing drug money, that he was blamed by an acquaintance, as he didn't participate in gang activity on his own. It is unknown if the murder weapon was recovered. Earlier in the evening, Ronnie had attended a house party in Providence. If you have any information, please call 1-401-333-1111. August 22nd, 2011. It was 2.18 a.m. when two state troopers from Boston heard gunshots. Robert, Bobby Bunctious McDaniel, was a 24-year-old returning from a night cruise on Viking Starliner when someone shot and killed him on the Seaport District Dock at 290 Northern Aff near the Bank of America Pavilion. Bobby may have been killed due to an earlier altercation on board. Bobby was transported to Tufts Medical Center, where he was pronounced deceased. The boat Bobby was on prior to his murder held 348 passengers, and it is unknown how many were on board that night. The cruise that evening was Hitmaker's Coke Boy, boat cruise hosted by Lou Armstrong and French Montana. Ladies were 18 plus, men were 21 plus. It seems very predatory, to be honest. Everybody knows the police lie, Darlene McDaniel said in a phone interview, declining to say where she lives now. Everybody knows my children weren't gang members. Darlene is referring to the claim that Kendall Street Thugs, or Kendall Street Team, or just KST for short, referred to themselves as a gang, but they didn't actually act like a gang, according to Darlene. According to law enforcement, though, KST were a violent street gang operating Framingham Mass in the early 2000s who have been accused of a disproportionate share of drug trafficking, guns, money, sexual assault, battery, and general gang violence. Bobby lived up to the KST requirements as he was charged with assault and battery and battery with a dangerous weapon after choking out a former girlfriend until she passed out during an argument stabbing her in the thigh with a pen, and punching her. The case was dropped when the girlfriend couldn't cooperate with prosecutors. Two other assault cases were dismissed due to lack of cooperation. Only a driving with a suspended license, which Bobby was due in court for the Thursday following his murder, and having faulty brake lights were the charges to stick to him. Others said of Bobby that he was a warm, caring individual who had a good family and many friends, and that he was a real good person. If he needed him to be there, he was there. Though KST are described by others as a bunch of kids, nothing serious, who wore matching t-shirts to the 2003 Boston Marathon that said, KST ain't no joke, and featured a gun firing bullets. KST typically go to intimidate people in groups of 8 to 10, 
Don't cooperate with police even when they are the victims. Fight amongst themselves and elsewhere, and have been known to murder their own. Bobby was 18 when he was shot the first time in 2005 as he walked down 2nd Street in Framingham. And unfortunately, Bobby wasn't Darlene's only son lost to gun violence. Another son, Joey, or Joe Bucks as he was referred to, was 19 when Eric Murray killed him over a girl. Joey was best friends forever to rapper Problem Child. At the shrine built for Joey, someone wrote, Stop snitching. Eric Murray's sentence was overturned as self-defense evidence wasn't turned over to the defense. Darlene made it known that Bobby had gotten into some trouble and was distancing himself from KST when he was murdered. Mike Smith, featured in October 2011's episode, was shot in the same complex. Please call 1-617-343-4470 or 1-800-494-TIPS with any information. August 22, 2011. Tyrus Sanders was a 28-year-old rapper, Quincy, Massachusetts resident, and basketball lover. Tyrus attended Dean College in Franklin, Mass., was part of a rap group called Live City, and worked at Hyatt Harborside at Logan International Airport before being laid off. Tyrus had a history with police, as in 2004, he was charged with distribution of a Class B narcotic in a school zone. Tyrus went to visit his parents in his old neighborhood in Kensington Park in Roxbury, Massachusetts, on August 22, 2011. And while Tyrus was standing and chatting with friends, someone approached and opened fire shortly before 9.30 p.m. Tyrus was killed, and a bullet from the gunman went through the wall of an 11-year-old boy's room. Thankfully, that child was not in the room at the time. If you have any information, please call 1-800-494-TIPS. August 24, 2011. Carmen Milagros Melendez, nicknamed Chi-Chi, loved to sing and act like a movie star. Carmen was born June 3, 1995, and had an unforgettable smile, was compassionate, and was about to become a sophomore at High School of Commerce. Carmen was in the care of the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families, and lived at a foster home in Springfield when she was killed. On the evening of August 24, 2011, Carmen was walking through a parking lot on her way home from her friend's place in Holyoke when at the corner of State and Andrew Street in Springfield, Mass., a stray bullet struck and killed her. The bullet came from the Mason Square section of the city. The shooting occurred at 11, and Carmen was pronounced deceased at 11.19 at Bay State Medical Center. Carmen is buried in Oak Grove Cemetery. One woman gave birth prematurely at the news of Carmen's murder, and in one online memorial... Carmen's former stepfather of six years left condolences, a testament to how substantial Carmen really was. Please call 1-413-787-6355 with any information. August 26, 2011. Omar Oaks Edwards was a beloved son of Maxine and Dennis Edwards, and was the father of Cheyenne. Omar was a Mattapan resident and brother to two. Omar's bullet-ridden body was removed from the backyard of the Triple Decker, located at 18 Homer Street, Mattapan, Mass., at 4.10 a.m. on August 26, 2011. Please call 1-800-494-TIPS with any information. August 27th, 2011. Trigger warning. Suicide and substance abuse. Marble Ace Arvidson, nicknamed Marb and Ace, son of Sigrid, was born June 14th, 1994, and named Marble 
because it is a strong and whimsical, attention-getting name. Marble has one brother named Soren. At the age of one, Sigrid moved herself and Marble away from an abusive relationship and was struggling with alcoholism. Sigrid faced her personal demons and Marble went to live with his great-grandparents from the ages of five to six and went again to live with his mom when she gained her sobriety. If you are struggling with sobriety, there is help. Visit aa.org or al-anon.org for more information and resources. At age 14, Marble was rebellious towards his mother, had violent altercations, including taking a maul, which is a sledgehammer with a wedge on one side, to the porch and parts of the foundation causing damage totaling over $3,000. Marble also enjoyed crafting and building things, being outdoors and live action role playing, or at least fake sword fighting with friends. Marble lived in multiple foster homes and gained close relationships with both the families. Sigrid laments that she wasn't close to Marble since freshman year of high school when he was sent to live to a foster home for the betterment of all, and then was moved to another, better suited home one and a half years later to address Marble's growing need for independence. Marble was in the custody of the Vermont Department of Children and Families and lived in a family's first home with one other teenage boy and two mentors in their 20s. The goal of this arrangement was to get the teens capable of living on their own in adulthood. Marble was placed in West Attleboro, Vermont, a town, quote, known for its hippies and left-wing politics, an open place a kid like Marble could fit right in. Marvel and his mentor would go for rides down the back roads of Vermont and listen to Bob Marley and discuss the world. Marvel was about to enter his senior year, was a B average student who was looking forward to college and had interests in several, including UVM. Marvel has a good sense of humor and is quick witted and gentle. Marvel also possessed a volatile temper, stayed out on occasion, wore black clothes, and honestly sounded like a typical hormonally challenged 17-year-old kid. Marble smoked weed and cigarettes. He was creative and empathetic, an incredible storyteller who understood suffering and understood laughing helps. On the day of August 27th, 2011, Marble's roommate said he saw Marble let in an unknown person in their late teens to early 20s who was shorter than Marble, wearing a black baseball cap at about 1.15 p.m., and by 2 p.m. they left via the home's back door. Marble left a note on the door saying that he was out with the gremlin horde, aka his friends, and that he'd be back in 30 minutes. Marble's girlfriend showed up about an hour later, and Marble still wasn't home. He then proceeded to miss his 4 p.m. plans with his girlfriend. Marble disappeared the day before Hurricane Irene landed, dumping seven inches of rain and causing major flooding. Hurricane Irene was a devastating storm that cost millions of dollars, close to $1 billion in damages. The home at 503 Marlboro Road, Route 9, at Sunset Lake Road in West Brattleboro, where Marble was staying, was thankfully untouched by the hurricane. But it was cut off from the town for three days as the Whitstone River overflowed. One source said that Marble was seen entering the woods, but not exiting. It also didn't mention the mystery man. There were no other leads, which in and of itself is odd. Days passed without word, and the fear grew. Even though Marble was in the care of DCF, he didn't have a history of running away, and there were no current signs of unhappiness. All of Marble's known acquaintances were contacted prior to reaching out to the police the following Sunday. 
Marble took his wallet with unknown cash value. However, his bank accounts remain untouched. Marble didn't own a cell phone. And Julie Cunningham, Marble's 11-year case manager, thinks that Marble would have reached out to people after Hurricane Irene cleared, checking in on them. There are differing theories as to what happened to Marble, including that he completed suicide, that he was abducted or harmed by the unknown man who appeared that day, who has yet to come forward, being taken away by rushing water during the hurricane. One source is quoted as saying, did he get high at a favorite hangout spot, slip on a rock, get washed away in a raging stream? Or did the near adult cleverly decide the upcoming storm was a golden opportunity to slip out of his hard scrabble life and quietly build a new one? Sigrid thinks someone knows what happened to Marble. In that good, bad, right, or wrong, someone has information. Sigrid also thinks that meeting with the mystery man turned into more than Marble was prepared for. Or that Marble went out hiking, slipped, and fell downstream. Or maybe he was straight up murdered. Larry Bodwin, Marble's grandfather, says that having plans with his girlfriend is enough reason to believe that he didn't disappear on his own. Marble's aunt is a woman named Sergeant Major Trish Kidridge, and she thinks that Marble is likely deceased, and there are slim chances of him being found alive. A mentor, unsure which one, said that Marble is likely deceased as he had bad judgment, was impulsive and impressionable, and that he was easily manipulated. Trish coordinated the numerous searches for Marble, as it was her speciality. Marble's mentor didn't participate in any of the searches because he didn't want to be the one to discover Marble's corpse. Known hiking areas of Marbles were searched. There were door-to-door -door canvases, local haunts were searched, and search dogs were utilized. The woods around Hogback Mountain were searched. These searches were funded by private donations. There was a one-month candlelight vigil held and a one-day hike-slash-ground-search hybrid called Hike for a Cause. Back to the mystery man for a moment. The lack of communication from the police can't confirm or deny if they know more than they are letting on about this individual, or if they are as in the dark as the rest of us. Trish, Sigrid, and Marble's girlfriend held numerous press conferences. And over the ten years Marble was first reported missing, investigators have re-interviewed hundreds of witnesses. Law enforcement... Well... Law enforcement admits that the original efforts to locate Marble were hindered due to resource strain because of the hurricane. It makes sense, unfortunately. There have been theories that Israel Keyes, murderer of the missing Vermont couple Lorraine and William Courier, was involved with Marble's disappearance. There is little evidence pointing to this as a viable scenario, though, and it's more likely someone Marble knew harmed him. Other even more discreditable theories tie into the Bennington Triangle Paranormal Angle, Alien Abduction, and the Bennington Monster. Another more credible theory is a rumor that Trish heard, where two young men meet, beat Marble to death. Another rumor that spread was one that Marble's girlfriend's ex-boyfriend, whom the couple were friendly with and spent time with that summer, had killed him as he had been put into jail for assault of a minor. The same summer that Marble's unnamed girlfriend and Marble got together was the summer that the girlfriend ended things with the violent boyfriend. One journalist named Dan Nichols took a particular interest in Marble Arvidsson's case, and his last thoughts on the matter are that he hopes that Marble chose to leave, and he is just somewhere else. Marble Arvidsson is 6 foot 2 inches, 165 pounds, and is a special needs, high-functioning individual. Marble has blonde hair and blue-green eyes and is a known self-harmer with scars on his arms and body. The last time he was seen, Marble was wearing a black button-down shirt 
black pants, black hiking boots, and a black Guatemalan fedora. Because Marvel liked to make a statement. And no jacket. It is debated on whether or not Marvel wore his hiking boots out or took them with him, but either way, his hiking boots were not located. Marble is friendly yet guarded, goofy and jovial. Marble has ties to different areas of Vermont, including Brattleboro, Dover, and Wilmington. According to one high school friend, Marble is scary smart when it came to personal relationships and that he knows many people, but is friends with few. And the few he is friends with, he is very loyal to. So not hearing from him for all these years is beyond uncharacteristic. There was an unconfirmed sighting of Marble in the Brattleboro area in April of 2012. Marble will be 29 this year, if still alive. Dental records and DNA are available for comparison. And according to Sigrid, the best I can do as a mom is love him in whatever form he is in right now. If you are or you know where Marble Arvidsson is, please call 1-802-251-8188 or 1-802-257-7946. August 31st, 2011. Anthony Tony Worrell was into computers and liked children. Tony was a Roxbury, Massachusetts resident and had a 2006 arrest for weapons violations at the age of 23, after being pulled over in an area where shots had recently been fired. Three others had miscellaneous weapon charges from that stop as well. On the night of August 31st, 2011, at 10.46 p.m., officers were called to the scene of Walford Way in McNulty Court Development for a report of someone shot. EMTs were there by the time police arrived. Tony was removed from the disturbingly large pool of blood from the single shot to the abdomen he suffered. Tony was transported to Mass General Hospital where he was pronounced dead. After Tony's death, his mom Cassandra met weekly with a grief counselor who specializes in grief and trauma after a homicide. Cassandra felt alone and withdrawn because people would pull away from her when she would talk about Tony's murder. Cassandra found a support group for homicide victims' families and say that they are lifelines for one another. Cassandra says that he might have taken my child, but he can't have me. Cassandra won't curl up all day and is relearning how to navigate life after her son's murder. If you or someone you know have any information, please call 1-800-494-TIPS or one 617 343-4470. If you have any questions, concerns, complaints, please email me at minepodcast at gmail.com. All one word and mine is spelled with two M's, two I's, one N, one E. Please include what your message is about in the subject line. Later, y'all.